do, I would like to invite Rod, who is the CTO of Aachen by Perforce, uh, to join me on stage. Uh, Rod, hello. Hi, Helen. And thank you for joining us at API Days. Um, whilst you're getting your screen up, could you just tell everybody where you're from and a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm uh, from Colorado. You might know uh, us from the fires right now. Just got a little snow to help put that out. And uh, CTO of Perforce uh, Software. I've been in, in software and a CTO now, actually for over 20 years in software for about 40 years. And uh, yeah. Well, I am. People, but uh, experience, let's say. I am looking at your deck now, which means we're ready to go. So over to you. I'll be back in 20 minutes to ask you some wrap up questions. Thank you. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. Take care. Good luck. All right. Thank you. So you can see my slides. That's great. So we'll jump right in. So we're going to talk about API lifecycle management. And you know, it, we hear a lot about security when it comes to APIs. And that's typically talking about runtime security, production security, um, keeping the hackers out. But there's another flavor of security, especially in the open banking world, financial world, uh, highly regulated industries, where you want to secure not just the final result of doing the development for an API, but the process itself, securing the development process, securing the process of moving code and APIs and endpoints from dev to QA to staging environments and finally to production. So that's what we're going to talk about. And why this is important, you can see some of the stats here. A lot of uh, large companies, enterprises, even in the, the banking world, aren't that confident that their security organization either can tell if there are bad actors trying to use APIs or even necessarily that they know all the APIs that are in production that are exposed to the outside world. There's uh, lots of ways that can happen. We're going to talk about some of these. So we're going to focus on um, how, do you, how do you know where these APIs are coming from? How do you get ahead of it? How do you secure the process? How do you secure workflows and approvals? but not slow everything down. You wanna go uh, as quickly as possible when you're doing this um, with CI, with CD, with DevOps, and still get a final highly secured product and a highly secured process as well. Okay. So quick intro, Zellin said I'm CTO of Perforce Software. Um, Akana, our API management, product is, is kind of why we're speaking today on the, the API side of the world. I've been CTO and, and founder of, of uh, OpenLogic, worked at a lot of big companies, small ones, speak worldwide at lots of events. Okay, so how do these APIs come about? Why is it that, that companies don't always know what they have? Well, there's obviously digital transformation is a big aspect. This is where uh, companies trying to open up new business channels, get to new partners you've never worked with before. Resellers, aggregators, VARs, consultants, uh, business partners, coopetition is involved. So this is new, new openings, new endpoints, new marketplaces, ecosystems, things like that. Then we, of course, have lots of development, uh, new web and mobile applications. You know, some of the analysts say we're in the midst of a boom of, of building 500 million new apps uh, in this next few years, massive amount of new development. So APIs, a lot of uh, companies going with an API first methodology, build the API, then build the UI, lots of mobile and web based on those APIs. So that, that introduces lots of holes in the firewall, new, new APIs, microservices, et cetera. And then finally we have special customer needs, big partners, um, integrators, consultants, other third party subsidiaries, et cetera, have special needs, special access to data. And often that's uh, in the form of new APIs, transforming EDI to APIs, things like that. So lots of, lots of ways and, uh, and paths for new APIs to happen. And that's one of the reasons why it's difficult to control. In a large enterprise, this can be hundreds, thousands of APIs being developed worldwide different teams, different technologies, different policies, governance, practices, et cetera. Hard to get your arms around. All right, so why is it so important to get security 
done right and think security first, why OK is not good enough? Well, we, we see all the time, right? Breaches, exposed data. Uh, you can see some of the stats here. Bugs, misconfigurations, even seemingly innocuous APIs can have damaging consequences, breaches with no relief in sight. And part of it is the volume, right? All these different channels and, and ways APIs are coming about. Part of it is the fact that you still have uh, humans in the loop in a lot of cases, system administrators, developers, QA people, ops people, doing things by hand. And even if that's uh, seemingly safe with good processes and in, in, in the repeatable, anything done by hand is dangerous. And that could be something as, as simple as after the final development is done, it's been fully tested, moved to staging. Now somebody needs to move that staging exposed API to the final production end user and customer partner facing uh, environment. Is there a manual step in there somewhere? Sometimes that can do damage. So we're gonna talk about how to automate as much as possible. Get people out of the loop, gain security across the API, all APIs consistently. And as we talked about, there's a lot of disruption with APIs. If you look at that top layer, the API layer, you can see there's a lot of steps from designing, integrating developer portals, security, traffic management, business analytics, technical analytics, a lot of moving parts there around the API layer. And then behind that, hopefully, uh, are things like microservices. You're not exposing those directly. Some companies do. That can be dangerous for lots of reasons. Uh, but lots of microservices moving very quickly with different technologies. You want all that secured consistently across the board with analytics. And then you have your deployment probably elastic, lots of automation, containers, cloud, et cetera. So lots of moving parts, different teams, different geographies, different processes. That's why this is so disruptive. So given that context, um, how do you prevent rogue services and APIs from getting deployed, from making it to production? How do you secure these processes so that uh, intentional or bad actors can't do as much damage, hopefully no damage? And how do you integrate so you can continue to go fast while you're locking things down? Well, I think it's it's important to think of API lifecycle management as truly an end-to-end -end, uh, situation. It's not uh, it's not just for production. It starts in planning when you're thinking about what to expose, to whom, what data can they access, what should be redacted, timeframes, limits quality of service, quotas, all those kind of things need to go into planning and make sure that you're, you're off to a good start. You're not waiting till later, that you have plans to test all of this and deploy it property, properly with security up front. Then of course, through development, what technologies, techniques is this REST, so GraphQL, JMS, right? All those different kind of considerations, what versions of open API, et cetera. How do we make sure that's tested and done right? And then operational governance, monitoring, metrics, management, self-healing, auto-scaling, all those kinds of things. Hopefully automation throughout the process. And underpin there, you can see policy governance. And this is a really critical point. You don't want to have people who need to remember to apply governance. You want that to be absolutely automated as much as possible throughout this entire process so that it's not something that can be forgotten. Uh, it can't be forgotten across individual APIs, across environments, in your CI, CD, doesn't matter. You want to automate that. Make sure you take as much of the potential for human error out of the loop as possible. And we'll talk more about that in detail. So key components in a lifecycle, lifecycle management, uh, we think of as three main components, lifecycle manager, coordinator, and repository. The idea with the manager is it's all about automating those workflows, sign-offs, approvals, et cetera. And that means doing validations across machines, across environments, uh, from developer to architect, QA, et cetera. We're gonna look at some examples of that coming up. A coordinator, which is all about, okay, now that, now that a human or whatever your workflow process is, maybe a mix of human and automated, says it's time to do something, let's execute. Let's move, for example, uh, the two QAs, that are, the APIs that are working in QA, to the staging environment or do the final deployment, move it from staging to production. 
all of that should be done through a coordinator that's fully automated, that does these promotions and eliminates hands-on actions as much as possible. And then finally, a repository to store extensible metadata so you can have workflows uh, that vary, maybe based on risk, security needs. Is this an internal only API? Is this public? Is it financial data? Is there sensitive customer information involved? You may have different workflows, different steps and approvals. So you need to put all that information in a repository so it's stored, tracked, managed, versioned, et cetera. So you can get compliance and traceability. Uh, then you have the actual approval process, right? Kind of a review. So here's a demo scenario. This can be done in lots of ways with lots of steps. One way to think of it is you've got three stages, requirements, design, development. We'll talk about what's after development next. So developer says, here's a new API. Uh, I need to have this reviewed. Maybe it's uh, an architect looks at it, a local architect on a team, solution architect, et cetera. Yes or no. Um, if it's no, you know, back to the drawing board, let's fix that up. If yes, maybe it's published, but only internally, and it goes to a design phase. Process gets applied, etc. You kind of tune things. Now you're you're ready to make a decision. Is this a go, no go? Do we start writing code? Do we start developing this? If yes, move to the development phase, go through that workflow, finally get approval. Uh, are we going to publish this AP or not? API or not? Maybe then it moves to a QA. So how does CICED fit in? Well, a lot of times you've got Jenkins or some equivalent platform. So developers are you know, checking in designs, plans, code, and you've got DevOps, stakeholders, architects, et cetera, making sure uh, all the, uh, the I's are dotted, T's are crossed. It's ready to go. You've got packaging, maybe documentation, testing, et cetera, whatever is required in your workflow. Then says, yes, that's ready to move on. At that point, lifecycle coordinator does the automated steps of promoting from development to test to staging to production. Again, you don't want humans involved dealing with SSH keys and, and changing tokens and, and all that kind of stuff. It's just massive gaps in security and, uh, and dangerous. And so, as you probably know, if you're in a financial world, open banking or some other, uh, some other regulated industry, a lot of times you don't even have network access. The networks are completely cut off from each other. You know, the production environment is separate from the staging environment, which is separate from dev and test. This is required for um, a lot of standards, PCI and open banking, et cetera, so that the users, even system administrators, would have to log on with different credentials, et cetera, to move um, API definitions, et cetera, policies, configurations from, let's say, staging to production. That's where you want to take that human out of the loop, automate it so you don't have to deal with tokens and, and giving humans extra credentials. Instead, you can automate those processes. And so how Akana fits in this, you may think of API management typically as the gateway or the runtime, that big red box in the center, the interaction layer, taking in API requests and doing something with them. And that's true, and that, and that is a really key part of API management is to have that, you know, converting data formats, JSON to XML, handling security and SAML and OAuth and OpenID and all that, transforming data management. And that is really important, but you've also got the things around that, like developer services, portals, management on the right, consistently applying security across all the APIs, all the teams, all the geographies with analytics technical analytics as well as business analytics. How are we doing? Are we making money through these APIs? So all of that comes with a kind of platform. An example of things you want to automatically apply, I talk about key security. Um, security policies, like for example, OWASP, the top 10 for APIs. Um, or if you have web APIs or web apps, there's different sets of, of standards and different sets of top 10 for those. But specifically for APIs, there's a handful of things here. And of course, there's, there's 10, it's top 10 most critical stuff. You can have those all applied automatically and consistently across every API by setting standard policies that developers don't have to necessarily know about or see. They're automatically taken care of at the API management layer. Things like malicious pattern detection, you know, look for SQL injection, JavaScript injection, uh, the, these kind of attacks and automatically 
reject those payloads, return faults. It doesn't even touch your code or your API. It's like an API firewall, really, that sits inside your API management layer. And again, automatically applying consistent policies, not something you have to remember. So what does this look like if we kind of tie it all together? We'll go through a quick demo scenario where we've got just three stage environment, dev test and acceptance test or staging environment, where you need, let's say a local solution architect to approve um, API uh, design implementation to exit the, the development stage to get to uh, the next stage, the test environment. And maybe you have optional notification to this enterprise architects, IT security, they can provide comments, et cetera. And then another approval to get from the, the local test environment to the acceptance or staging environment. And then if you have an API owner or an API product manager, a lot of companies are moving towards that needs to upgrade from one version to the next, how can that be done? How can that promotion happen? So quickly then, here's what uh, uh, the Akana product looks like or or the, uh, the equivalent in your environment of how do we manage all this securely in an automated fashion. So API is in uh, development stage. It's got metadata, it's got tags, you know, searchable, sortable, et cetera, comment trails, feedback. And the developer says, okay, I, I want to get this approved. There's an, a request to get development approval by the API owner, fills out all the, the appropriate information about the API goes to the solution architect, they can approve, reject, ask for more information, ask for comments, et cetera, and optionally request feedback from enterprise architect group, IT security, et cetera. They can all uh, chime in, record all that in one place where it's easy to track and manage, not through emails and spreadsheets, but a system that you can report and have full traceability, compliance reporting. Then once that's approved, the environment that uh, lifecycle coordinator can can start an auto promotion to move from development to the test environment, which may involve changing keys, different configurations, different scalability, et cetera. All that can be automated. Move to from there, then once it's fully tested, QA is happy with it, move to pending promotion to move to the acceptance test or staging environment, to get the final approval from a solution architect, all the details are tracked, Again, the back and forth, uh, timestamps, state stamps, all the attributes, metadata is captured, can be recorded, uh, and then finally move to that staging environment. And this can be fully uh, auto-managed, multi-tenant in your organization by division, by department, by group, et cetera, with their own policies and rules with automatic policies and rules enforced at higher levels that can't be overridden or they can be, again, that's up to you, very configurable. And then finally, the example of an API owner or product manager going through a, a process of looking for a minor version update, right? It's a non-breaking change, can request that change, get approval, and automatically push that to the environment. So that's it for a, a quick talk. Um, Akana does run in fully in the cloud as a SaaS uh, environment, uh, primarily AWS or fully on-prem, completely behind your firewall on your environment, or in a hybrid mode, where, for example, you can have your sensitive APIs or maybe using uh, JMS, other legacy access to mainframes, other, other environments, other protocols that you feel need to be behind your firewall. You can do that, but still have uh, the portals and other management analytics, et cetera, in the cloud managed by us. So very flexible in terms of hybrid deployment on-prem or fully in cloud. And so with that, I will turn it back over to Helen to see if we have questions. And while that's coming up, just reminder you can do a quick start. We've got uh, ways to get going uh, very quickly uh, in the, the SaaS environment with uh, bandwidth determined uh, measurement of usage. Rod, thank you, and thank you for helping me to keep this track on time. It's <laughs> like a, a real pro. You said at the top you've, you've done this before, and clearly you have. Um, in our in our chat beforehand, you, you asked me something that um, that intrigued me. So you said that you wanted to sort of prevent people um, 
uh, being able to, to manually uh, get, get into the production process. What would be your sort of three top, um, you know, headline tips for doing that? If you bullet points, what would they be? Okay. Well, I think the first one is, you know, to, to have a really clear, hard stance that says uh, no manual inter intervention in the production environment. So you don't want system admins, even if it's, uh, you know, typically even emergency type things should be worked out in advance. Don't let people SSH or connect to those machines and change things manually. Just way too dangerous for security reasons, making mistakes under time pressure, et cetera. So lock that down. Another one would be to automate the, the process of moving from development to QA to staging to production so that you're not tempted to do anything by hand. So that's just clear to everyone. Uh, don't even provide those credentials to people so they can get in manually. Instead, require everything to be configured in a tool, uh, whether it's a con or something else, so that once the decision is made, we're now ready to, to push from staging to the final production. All the processes, including the configuration of the machine, the scaling parameters, the tokens, the security password, the redaction, the security policies for production environments, all of that is 100% automated. That helps you to go fast, to still have CI, CD, continuous deployment even to production while maximizing security and reliability. So those would be my top tips. Wow, an absolute masterclass, thank you. So all that uh, remains for me is to, um, Oh, I do have um, one uh, quick question that came in a little bit of a, a, a last minute one. So um, I'm going to read it um, as, as it's coming in. Um, thank you, Dexter. It says, it's still surprising how many um, OWASP 10, OSP, uh, 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 yeah, uh, oh, wow. uh, thank you, um, seem to be overlooked in implementations, despite the fact that these attack vectors have hardly changed in years. Glad to see it mentioned, even if briefly. Definitely a case for delegating IP API management. There you go. Some positive feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And I, I would like to, to uh, piggyback on that and say, yeah, it's it's true that we see these those uh, those OWASP top ten issues perennially, uh, especially things like SQL injection has been at the top of the the web list for OWASP for probably fifteen years, and it's it's still the most common attack vector, it's still exposed. People still aren't paying enough attention to it. So I think same thing goes with the API top 10. You know, get your arms around this. Don't don't be hacked because you didn't pay attention to the number one even top way for people to break in and do damage. Pay attention to it to get it done right. Brilliant way to finish. Um, I said it before, but I'll say it again, absolute masterclass. Rod, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very, very much for joining us at API Days. Uh, you can relax now. Job done. Job well done. And enjoy the rest of this track. Thank you. Take Thank you, Helen. Appreciate it.